Day one was four and a half years ago when we went live. Uh, we stood up the HR payroll back office with finance procurement. That's fine, it all worked fine. We can, uh, you know, we run a lot of, of natural services from that. Uh, improved the way we do things, more transaction capability than we've done before, uh, greater financial management than we've had before. And then the front office now we're working on the transactional systems around rating or taxation, uh, legislation, which is compliance, whether it's a dog license, a resource consent, a building consent, uh, health and safety certificate. So that's the next phase that goes live uh, July next year, phase one. Phase two goes a year later. And as I said, we just set up the, the mobile platform for trial to do um, citizen engagement. So when you have uh, a pothole or a graffiti or, or um, illegal fly tipping, uh, rubbish dumps, um, citizens can you know, track it, send in the request, get the process through uh, our standard processes. Longer term, it will be all the way through into SAP. And then we'll do workforce management, which we'll either do internally or through third party contractors. So it's all about optimization. So, you know, give the, and engaging the citizens more. You know, normally a, a government body is seen as a parental, you, you will do this, you will do that. This is trying to engage more, building a better city for the citizens and the visitors and the ratepayers and the customers of, of Auckland. So it's a, it's a massive undertaking for us. It's a big transformation program. Um, so there's a lot of work based, you know, it's an SAP first strategy, wherever we can put it. <laughs> I mean, obviously, in politics, there's always people that are for and against it. So what, what have been the obstacles and, and challenges that you faced? Um, as I said, the merger came about three of the legacy councils that existed had SAP anyway. So we got over that hurdle because the three largest ones has SAP. It made no reason why not to go to SAP. You know, there were, we've got 5,000 applications. We're now trying to merge onto a single platform whether it's graffiti management, cemetery management, art and culture, all in terms of um, uh, the processes that we operate as a service. We, we offer over 3,000 services to the community. So all of that will run at some point, whether it's a billing aspect, a, a rate aspect, a, a certificate aspect through an SAP module at some point. Um, so the challenge has been I wouldn't say it's been a challenge, but people getting used to the new processes and the new system. You know, some people were never used SAP. Obviously, you've got to go through the education process. We've done that with most people uh, that needed to run this, the, the back office. Uh, now we're into the next phase, and as we roll out the new, the new solutions, then obviously we'll educate and upskill you know, the relevant staff that need it. Our next phase, our first phase rollout, will need 1,200 people upskilled into SAP to do taxation and, and uh, regulatory compliance. So that's a big change program. And the technology is kind of the easy bit, ish. Um, the main bit is the education of people and the change program of new ways of working, new processes, um, new structures and form in terms of operating models, which is probably the challenge itself. So how long do you think uh, it's going to take for the next phase? So I said phase one of our next delivery will go live July next year. Okay. That's when we move approximately 200,000 properties onto the new system. And then a year later, we'll do another 300,000. So are you guys kind of one of the first people in the world kind of leading the way on this? So in taxation, we're one of the first, I think, if not the first, um, around uh, calculation of rates uh, and then production of rates onto SAP. Uh, around consenting, I think we're one of the first as well. So we're, up, we're not at the bleeding edge, but we're, we're you know, up against it. So, I mean, data probably, big data probably plays a part in the way that you run the city. How, how is a data-driven economy changing the way cities are run? Um, we look at data in terms, like most governments now, data's got to be open. It's, you know, we have a, a policy of open data within Auckland. Uh, any, any citizen can ask for most things and we have to provide that information back to them as a request. Uh, if we flip it the other way, we should just publish it anyway for you know, the majority that we can. Uh, some elements we can't for compliance reasons. So data is there to be presented. Governments across the world are looking at open data, how the citizens recall. Other citizens want more transparency in what, what's happening within a government environment. 
And that's being driven by uh, a need to know, a need to understand, but also a need to, to prove to citizens that the expenditure that we have, because it's your money that we're spending, and it's my money as well, is being spent correctly. And that's the challenge that we have to, com I won't say convince, but to, to prove that what we spend our money on is worthwhile for the community and the community buy into that process and um, engage in that process even more so. It's all about how do we engage the citizen more and more into our, our thought processes, our, our, our planning processes. Um, we've just gone through what we call the long-term plan, uh, which is a 10-year view of how we're going to spend money. And citizens have been engaged in that process. We've had a, the biggest uplift in terms of responses that we've ever had over the, over the last two or three that we've done. Um, and that's because people want to understand more and want to uh, want to view more of what we're doing and how we're doing it. So it's it's basically engagement and efficiency. Engagement, engagement and efficiency. It's also you know we've got to look at growth. As Auckland grow over the next uh, few years, we reckon Auckland will grow by another million people. So how do we plan for that urban base to, to grow either upwards or outwards or both? Uh, how do we put infrastructure in place to support it? How do you put schooling in place? How do you put uh, roading, how do you put rail, how do you put services in place, how do you put libraries, you know, all of that's got to be planned through data and analytics of one way, shape or form. It's, uh, it's all part of a development model going forward. So does this, does this save you money in the long run? Yes. The, the, the consolidation bill, you know, so we've got 5,000 odd applications. We're going to consolidate those down to one of something. The majority will land on SAP where we can. Um, but most of it will be about cost reduction. You know, citizens want cost reduction. We want lower, lower tax increases, but, but we want higher, higher quality services delivered. And that's the only way you can do it, is through optimization. So, I heard uh, Bill McDermott, his, his yep. keynote speech, and it seemed like the S4 HANA was the big thing. Do you see you guys using that in the future? We're in the process of um, migrating onto the HANA platform now. So we're in the QA. Uh, we needed to run the next set of services. Uh, and obviously it's, a, it's the platform of the future for SAP. So to, to be concurrent with support and you're driven down that model anyway. Um, but we'll, you know, we'll be there over a period of time.